Thanks, everybody. Uh, just going to be a few minutes, and then I'll leave you in the knowledgeable hands of the more charming of the two presenters. Right. So uh, we're going to talk about the top five mistakes. Uh, so that's us, Stabarnella and Stoy and Stefanov. So the first thing that I wanted to mention is uh, why do we want to optimize CSS? Uh, and um, the, the first mo most important thing to me is that uh, it blocks the progressive rendering. And progressive rendering is good, progress is nice. Uh, but uh, CSS um, is interfering with that. So I have a test page here just to make the thing obvious. Okay, so this is one page that has one uh, HTML uh, file, one CSS file, and then another CSS file. So both of the, the CSS files are delayed. Oh, oh joy. <laughs> anyway, I guess it's not going to work. So uh, basically what I wanted to show you that it, okay. Okay, so we have HTML coming in, and then uh, it shows up on styled. Then another, whoa, what's <laughs> Oh, okay. Is that you? Beautiful. Okay, yes. Okay. Again, the HTML page. Uh, then one CSS coming over, a little bit delayed. Something is rendered. Then another CSS is coming down the pipe, and then something else is rendered. So this is a sort of a progressive rendering, but Opera is the only browser that does that. Um, most of the browsers will do something like this. So I have the net panel open so you can see what's going on. HTML arrived, nothing happens, waiting for the CSS stuff. CSS arrives, nothing happens, because we have another one coming. And eventually, we see the styled page. And what's even worse is that even if the second style sheet is a print style sheet and it's not going to be used at all, then the browser will still wait for that. So uh, that's why you know, it's important to optimize CSS, uh, have efficient rules, uh, and so on, but that's... Uh, uh, we have a bigger fish to fry, right? It's it's really important to keep the uh, the file size small because again, nothing will render until it arrives, right? So the other thing is that we can minify, right? We can minify CSS and JavaScript to make them smaller. But the thing about CSS is that um, it doesn't, it cannot minify as well as, as JavaScript because we cannot rename things like text decoration underline. There's no way we can make that smaller. So our CSS needs to be fast by default. So we did a study of the Alexa top 1000 sites uh, and that's how it went. So you get a list of sites, uh, start Fiddler in the background and then load each file with a script and then export the results from Fiddler and, and start looking at them. So this is the PHP script, I'm not going to talk about it, but it just opens IE and closes it on load. And b before we start talking about the, uh, uh, how to write smaller CSS, this is uh, just to see that uh, we're actually not doing the very basics, right? 42% of the sites have at least one CSS file that is not gzipped. 44% have more than two CSS files. Some have ridiculous amount, like 40. 56% uh, of the sites serve CSS with cookies. Not a good idea. And 62% uh, of the sites don't even minify. So uh, by minifying, I just forced minified everything with YUI compressor. And these are 62% of the sites had improvement of at least 10%. So what about the CSS sizes in general? So we have about 24% kind of smaller CSS under 10K. And then uh, the majority is uh, between 10 and 50. I'm coming from the search engine background, right? Oh, so to me, 10K is a lot. But um, then people go over to 100, and then even 21% of all the sites are even more than 100K. 
This is a uh, slide that Dave, David Way shared last year at Velocity for Facebook that they have uh, almost two megs of style sheets. So this was, I mean, this is all the style sheets that they have written. They don't use them all on the same page, right? But this is a pretty significant number. So um, with that, let me give you Nicole Sullivan to talk a bit more of the specifics and more importantly, how to fix stuff. Yeah. I have to, when I speak with a handheld, I have to hold my arm down because I talk with my hands and otherwise you'll hear every third word that I say. <laughs> okay, um, so how many people have heard of kudzu? Yeah, are you all from the South, maybe? Um, so kudzu was a really fantastic idea, not so much. Um, the idea was that the uh, Soil and Conservation Service started importing kudzu to the U.S. as a, as a magic plant that was going to um, stop soil erosion, and they planted it everywhere, uh, basically all over the South. Um, what they didn't know is that it's incredibly invasive. It's almost impossible to eradicate it once, once you have it. Um, it basically... Uh, turned into a, a big failure and kind of an environmental disaster. And it looks sort of beautiful. If you look at the, the picture in the background, it makes these sort of majestic looking landscapes, but then you realize, oh my God, that's a car there in the bottom right corner. And that's a whole lot of leafy, leafy viney kudzu uh, basically covering the environment. Um, cutting it back, burning it, all kinds of things just basically lead to more kudzu. Um, and what I think we have on the net these days and what I think our findings uh, from the, the top 1,000 search showed is that we have a, a CSS kudzu problem. Um, and we have to find the way, the magic method, that's going to allow us to um, eradicate that kudzu. And also, you know, hopefully do the, the keeping it fast by default by having the right methods in place. How many folks have heard of object-oriented CSS? Okay, so quite a few. Um, all right, so that's my, you know, my method for making CSS smaller. Um, but what I've heard a lot in the last year since I, since I started speaking about object-oriented CSS is, oh, it's a fantastic idea, but we really can't do that. You wouldn't believe the mess we have. Um, I've heard that a lot of times. Um, it's absolutely not true. Um, Facebook decided to go on a diet last year. Um, and I actually started consulting with them just after Velocity last year when they, you know, talked about their 1.9 meg of, um, of CSS. And we started looking at what they could do to fix it. Um, and it's really amazing. I don't know how many people have been lucky enough to work for a company that has really decided that they are going to um, go full throttle to get their performance better, but this was an amazing experience. Um, it was made up of a lot of different pieces, a lot of different teams working on different projects to kind of pull the entire performance uh, puzzle together. But in particular, I was consulting working on the, on the CSS piece, um, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, and the results of the project were that, you know, in something like six months, they reduced their response time in half. That's pretty incredible. I was really impressed by their, uh, their sort of commitment to the, to the project. And also by how freaking smart the developers are there. Um, yeah, seriously. Um, so what is object-oriented CSS? Because there were some people who didn't have their hands up earlier. Um, is it a framework, a philosophy, or a tool? It's kind of all of the above, but it's more like an evolution of the language. Um, it makes CSS more powerful. We've focused a lot on what happens in between the curly braces. Um, we've done a ton of work on how to get things to work cross-browser, on how to um, make sure that our uh, styles are going to look the same no matter where they are. Um, but what we haven't focused on previously is our selectors. And our selectors are actually where the architecture of our CSS lives. Um, and that's where we need to focus on, and that's where object-oriented CSS focuses on, in order to make much, much, much less code. Um, it's also easier for newbies because less code is just easier for them to get started with. Um, one example from the, the open source project is the grids. It allows all these different uh, layouts and, that are seen on the right-hand side, all the different ways of dividing columns. They're infinitely nestable and stackable, and they don't break. Um, and it's 570-something bytes uh, for the entire thing, 14 lines of code. 
Um, so that's the kind of thing you get when you start getting the architecture right, um, is you get this sort of automatic reduction in the just general amount of code you're sending over the wire. So how do you do that? Um, it's complicated, but these are the, the rough idea. This is my, uh, my sort of equation for um, how you end up with massive CSS. So roughly, don't do that, and you'll end up with much smaller CSS. Um, but let's talk about each of them um, in turn. Number five is granularity fail. Um, a lot of times, we don't know what granularity our CSS objects need to be written at. And in fact, we might match the granularity to another layer of the architecture because we haven't quite uh, understood what CSS architecture should look like. Um, so Lego are really interesting toys, right? There are a few really basic blocks. And using those basic blocks, we can construct all kinds of different things. Um, they're really simple pieces, but if you want to make an automobile out of Lego and you're really, really dedicated and have a lot of time, you can do it. Uh, Lego Einstein. I wanted to find a Lego Crockford, but I don't think anybody has ever done it. <laughs> this guy's pretty amazing. He's actually making art out of Legos. His brickartist.com. I found it. It was just so cool, the stuff that he's making. And uh, wouldn't you know it, he made a picture of us when we think about optimizing CSS. So... Um, we want to kind of do the same thing with CSS. The, the architecture of CSS is roughly like taking our little Legos, making our little building blocks, and then making it possible to using, using those building blocks to build more complex objects. Um, but what are we doing wrong? Um, first up, we're mostly getting the granularity wrong. And it sort of sets up a site for, for architecture fail. If you've gotten the granularity right, it's re wrong, sorry. It's really hard to get anything else to go right. Um, so how do you figure out if, you're, if your architecture and your granularity are correct? Um, the best way is to do a visual inventory of your site. This is really hard for you to do because you're so connected to your site. Um, it, it makes it really impossible to see it, but you want to, as much as possible, try to look at it with fresh eyes. So you might take one PHP object like this. This is from the, the Facebook site. This is one stream story. Um, so you notice it's got the you know, the little things that I said and then the comments from, from friends and likes and stuff like that. But you need to break it down into smaller pieces. Um, it might look like one object in the PHP layer, but in the CSS layer, it's actually seven smaller objects. So it's a heading, it's a media block, five different examples of a media block, which is image to the left and some text that goes with it to the right or, or content that goes with it. It's a comments list, an action list, a paragraph, and then a couple of link styles. So what you'll notice is when you start breaking things down at uh, the right granularity layer for the CSS rather than for the PHP, you find the same repeating patterns over and over and over again. All of a sudden, your site isn't these very unique pieces. It's just patterns. Um, so you want to do this for headings, for example. Uh, you want to go through your site, maybe top 10 pages. It depends, you know, how your traffic's distributed. But go through your site and look at all the different pages and break out all the tiny objects. You can do headings. Um, you want to kind of make, uh, it's almost like a library of your tiniest objects. And then when you want to build something, rather than thinking, okay, I'm going to write the CSS for this, you think, okay, what objects am I going to grab from my existing library to build this page? And then you only build the tiny bits that don't exist already. Um, so at Facebook, uh, Chad Little did an amazing job. He went through all of their style sheets and basically eradicated all of their headings. And they, they had a really uh, high number. So it was an incredible amount of work. Um, so again, it's all about pattern matching. It's about looking at your site and trying to find those little visual semantics, the visual patterns that, um, that define the site and that, that repeat across the site. And your PHP objects are not going to be equal to your C CSS objects. Be careful. Beware. You will be tempted, especially if you're more comfortable in the middleware layer. You're going to want to apply that architecture to, uh, to a layer where you're maybe less comfortable, the CSS layer. Um, I think one thing to keep in mind is that, um, is that we did start sandboxing for a good reason, because our code was super fragile, and we wanted, to, we wanted it to be uh, 
a little more workable, a little more robust, um, but it actually had really negative consequences for performance. And so we're basically sandboxing based on the way the PHP objects work, and that's making a mess in, in our CSS layer. Sort of like if you took your DB schema and tried to configure Apache with it. Like, it doesn't make any sense, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't do that. But we expect CSS to correspond to other layers in the architecture in a way that, that really doesn't work. Okay. How, wait, I have a question before I continue. How many people pr develop CSS as their primary job? Wow, very few. Okay, what do you do? Are um, front end developers? Okay. Back end? And middleware? Okay. Ops? Yay, ops. <laughs> okay. Uh, wow, you're, it's sort of all over the map. Is there something I missed? All of the above, yeah. Sure. Sorry? Uh, architecture. architecture. Okay, cool. All right, well, we're everywhere. Everybody does everything, it looks like. Okay, so the next one is stale rules. Um, CSS absolutely gets crufty. Um, stuff gets old, it isn't used anymore. Um, the one thing we need to do is distinguish between the two different kinds of stale, because there are two kinds. Uh, one is truly stale, and it's rules that are no longer used across your entire site that just haven't been cut out yet. Um, that's something that needs to be fixed for sure. But there's a more subtle um, level of stale rules, which is rules that are used after a user action or on a secondary page load that aren't used currently, but will be used later. And that's more delicate, because we want to have some stuff already in the cache so that our next page load looks super fast. Um, so it's sort of uh, not something you're going to try to reduce to zero. It's something you're going to try and get to, uh, you know, a stable number and then watch how it changes. So the first thing to look at is which kind do you have. Um, try dust me selectors, especially with, uh, you can give it a site map and it will check uh, more broadly than one single page. Um, and then you want to track them over time and actually look at changes in that value as opposed to... Um, uh, as opposed to some absolute correct number or incorrect number. Um, the third thing that causes massive CSS is unpredictability. Um, we want to make each object predictable. We want to know how it's going to behave wherever we put it. So for example, um, if both of these headings are in H3 and we just happen to turn the right one purple because it's in the right column, that's an extremely unpredictable behavior. Um, it doesn't make sense. It wouldn't, wouldn't be the kind of thing we do in any other kind of programming environment. And yet, uh, for CSS, it's something that we do all the time. Uh, we think of it, it's actually considered one of the best practices right now, is that you, you, know, you style things based on where they happen to fall in, in our HTML structure. Um, but it's really uh, pretty terrible for performance. Um, so the rough rule is that a heading shouldn't become a heading in another part of the page. What does that mean? If you have a heading that's giant and pink in one part of the page and you put it somewhere else, it shouldn't become tiny and blue. Um, it should be one predictable Lego chunk uh, of sort of behavior and style. An example of this is um, if I have modules. So say I have a weather module and a tabs module, and inside that I've declared H3 to be red and blue. That doesn't work because I can't have a blue heading inside my weather module, I can't have a red heading inside my tabs module, and I can't have either one of them if I'm not in either of those modules. So we're basically making these little completely unreusable pieces when we write code this way. Um, so it's one of the best practices that seriously needs to die. Okay, so how do you know if you have unpredictable code? Look for foo h3, bar h3, baz h3 uh, in your code, and you'll know straight away that those h3s aren't reusable. They exist only in that one place. Um, you can also just grep for uh, h1 to 6 and see how many you have. Um, if you've got a lot of h1s to h6s, it means you're going to need a site-wide heading solution. Um, so, so Anne and I found in our tests that um, the worst offender had 511 declarations of H1 to H6 in their style sheets. And this is on one single page load. So that's, um, that's a lot. Um, but even more interesting is that 56% had more than 10. Now, that might not seem like a lot to have more than 10 declarations of H1 to H6, but how many different font sizes are actually like readable by humans. Now if we discount everything below 10 pixels, like seven pixels is for 
what, my sized fonts, so that doesn't work. And if we discount anything that's gonna be too big to be really seen on a browser, uh, on a, you know, a normal resolution browser screen, there actually are not that many different font sizes. Um, so even having more than 10 declarations of H1 to H6 is a little bit weird. Um, and that's more than half of, half of the sites in the Alexa Top 1000 are, are, um, uh, have trouble with that rule. So at Facebook, I uh, grepped their style sheets. Now keep in mind, this number is across all their style sheets. So it's not on any one page load because they have a really neat packaging system that automatically grabs the CSS required for any particular part of the page. Um, so this would never be like somebody's user experience. Um, but when we started out uh, working on the CSS, we found that there were 958 declarations of H1 to H6. Clearly that's too many. Um, what happened after they implemented some of the ideas of OOCSS is that they got down to 25. Um, so it's a pretty big, drastic change that happens in the size of your style sheets when you start making these, these improvements. And again, that was the work of, of Chad Little on their UIE team. Okay, so next up is specificity wars. Um, this definitely contributes to gigantic CSS. Um, Specificity wars happen when you get a team and they're sort of lobbing specificity bombs over the cube wall. Um, they're like, ha ha ha, my selector is more specific than yours. And the next one says, ha ha, I threw in an ID. And the next one says, oh, I've got an important in mind, beat that, you know. And you end up with this sort of war, this tension in a team where everybody's just trying to be more specific than the guy who wrote the code the week before. That way they can win out if there's ever a conflict. This is one of the the most amazing ways to end up with gigantic CSS and also CSS that's unmaintainable because who knows why this one has a specificity of one point more than that one. It, it, it makes no sense and basically the architecture gets completely bogged down in this kind of, uh, this kind of struggle. And uh, a lot of people have said to me, oh well, you know, that only applies on, on big teams and that sort of thing. But what I've found is that it applies even with me on a project by myself. Because me six months from now says to me six months ago, what the hell were you thinking, right? It looks at my code and says, what, what was that? Why was this like that? And I end up in a specificity war with myself, even on my own personal blog. Um, so it's really important to, to basically disengage from the specificity war and, and make some decisions about how, how to do that. My opinion, the specificity, specificity completely screws up the cascade, it sucks. Um, the cascade is awesome, it kind of rocks, and it has a lot of power, and it can do a lot of things, but using specificity incorrectly is, is really, really screwing up the cascade. So how do we simplify specificity? First up, we want to use hacks sparingly. I don't know how many people would admit to um, using classes like .ie that you're, you're adding to the body that then targets IE. Anybody willing to admit it? Yeah, there are lots of people that do it, and okay, I checked the Alexa Top 1000, so some of you do it too, and you're not admitting it. <laughs> um, so yeah, hacks are gonna happen. Everybody needs a little bit of zoom in their life. Um, IE is gonna need to be hacked every now and then. First though, if you're hacking Safari and Firefox, and if you're hacking the newer versions of IE, you're doing something wrong, go back and look at your architecture. That's a first step. But if you find yourself needing to use hacks for IE6, IE55, IE7 even, um, that's reasonable. Just do it in a way that isn't gonna impact your specificity. That means no classes.ie. Um, you wanna use a star and underscore hack. It looks ugly, but it makes sense. It should feel a little bit ugly when you have to add a hack to your code. Um, so I like star and underscore in that way because it feels a bit gross, um, but also because it doesn't change your specificity at all. The next important thing is to avoid styling IDs. Um, IDs completely override your class structure, so they're, they're a whole new level in the specificity chain. Um, they basically make one rule completely more powerful over all the other rules that you've written. Um, generally, I, I completely avoid using IDs for any kind of styling. Um, every time I think it's okay to use one, then me six months from now says, oh my God, what were you thinking? Um, so I would just completely, completely skip IDs except for obviously targeting in JavaScript. Um, which makes a lot of sense. 
important is the same. It's gonna completely override the styles that you've already written. So the only time that you wanna use it is on a leaf node. Um, a leaf node is something you know it's not gonna contain anything else. You're not gonna have issues with stuff cascading inside of it. It's an, you know, an override style that you know, abstracts out some repeating little bit of code like you know, setting a font color to be a highlight color or um, overriding a default margin, something like that. So that's the case when it would make sense to use, uh, to use important, but overall um, it's something to be avoided. Um, so the worst offender in the Alexa top 1000 had um, 518 declarations that used important. Now if that isn't specificity wars, I don't know what is. Um, somebody's fighting. You end up with your entire, entire style sheet being written with important, basically. Um, so I think that uh, another interesting number is the 12%, uh, which have greater than 50. Now you are gonna have some importance. Like I said, for those little mix-ins, those little like, you know, changing the font color to a highlight color, it makes sense to use important. That way you know it's gonna win and it's not part of the cascade in a way. Um, but having more than 50 seems like kind of a lot. So what do you wanna do? Uh, that's a lot of don't do this and don't do that. Um, you do wanna style classes rather than elements. Um, classes are gonna allow you to have a consistent specificity and, and consistently judge what rule will win in different cases. Um, you also wanna style, um, style things without their elements. So you wanna do like dot error. And then the only thing you would put in a particular elements declaration is the exceptions. Like if this error is also a paragraph, um, then do this. Um, but most of the code should actually go in the dot error class here. Um, you also wanna give all rules the same strength. So here I'm targeting an element with a class head, HD. Um, I want all of my rules that target my dot HD to have the same length because I'm using only classes, and then I know that they have the same specificity. Um, that allows us to really predictably uh, figure out how our inheritance will work. Um, the last bit is duplication. Um, so duplication is a serious problem for CSS kudzu. Um, it's, it's sort of where things go crazy. Um, grep is your friend here. It's so funny because sometimes I speak at design conferences and sometimes I speak at techie conferences and at the design conferences they're like, oh my God, she's such a geek. <laughs> and one of them said, she said grep, ha 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 So yeah, it's an interesting two completely different worlds. Um, but anyway, grep is absolutely your friend in this process and if your, your CSS is mainly managed by your design team, you might need to help them with this. Um, it might not be something they're particularly comfortable with, but it's a tool they can definitely use to help understand where their CSS has gone awry. Um, so these are just some basic things. Um, if I grep for, for margin, uh, how many times I'm, I'm resetting my margins to zero, for example, um, if I'm doing that a lot of times, it means that I need a reset style sheet. I'm not using like, for example, YUI's reset style sheet is kind of amazing. Why laughing? Okay, <laughs> funny. All right, um, so the worst offender. Reset the margin to zero 518 times. Um, you got to reset, do your resets one time. Once I started using the YUI uh, reset.css style sheet, um, my time for debugging IE went down to something like nothing. Um, it, it's really important. A lot of times it isn't an actual bug, it's just that uh, our, um, our resets are different. Our, our base styles are different in different browsers. Um, so using a reset style sheet can get a lot of those repeating declarations of both margin and padding removed from your style sheet. Yeah, so, oh, this is funny. So 14% had greater than 100. So that's pretty high, that 100 declarations of, of uh, margin zero. Um, next up is float. So what does float mean? If you're using float too many times, it means that you don't have a grid system. It means that you don't have a consistent, abstracted way of laying out elements in your page. If you need something divided in three, like one third, one third, one third, for example, if you're using float a lot of times, it means you don't have a consistent, easy way of doing that. And you should look at including a grid system on your site. So the worst offender had declared uh, float 733 times. This isn't just a problem of, of, of performance, which is, you know, that we're 
that we're repeating this code over and over and over again, it's also a problem of, of maintenance. This means that anytime anybody works on any particular object, they need to figure out how, how the code works. How did this guy decide to do his columns? How did that girl decide to uh, lay out her you know, little items in a row? So it means relearning in every single object how, uh, how the thing is laid out at all. Um, so two different points. But in the Alexa, um, in the Alexa uh, Top 1000, there were 14% uh, Wait a minute. Okay, 13% that had uh, greater than 100 uh, floated elements. Um, so that's a really significant, uh, significant issue because frankly, if you're using a grid system, I'd be surprised if you have more than say 10 floated elements because you've got a grid system set up. You don't have to do that over and over again. Um, so 64% of the Alexa Top 1000 had, had greater than 10 declarations of, of float. Font size is another one to look at. Font size is a curious one because it can be headings disguised as something else. A lot of times we'll just have a div which increases the size of our headings. So you can't just grep for H1 to H6. You also need to start looking at uh, how many times your font size has been changed. Um, so the worst offender changed font size 889 times. There are not 889 different usable fonts on the web. Um, so seriously, uh, could be reduced. A lot of potential gain there. Um, I would say a more typical number is, is a bit lower than that, but 23% um, had greater than 100. So really, we're kind of off. Things, the, the way we're writing CSS is, is, uh, is broken. Our best practices are actually causing us harm and pain. Um, so how did Facebook reduce duplication? I want to give you a particular example. Um, this one is the media block, and I talked a little bit about it before. It does an image to the left, and then some text or whatever that describes it to the right, so some content that goes with it on the right. It could be headings, could be, uh, could be lists, could be anything. Um, so all of these, what we discovered at Facebook is that all of these are actually the same object. They look a little different. The image size might vary. A few other things vary, but they are the same basic object. So we said, okay, what do we know about this object? What, what can we determine to be true about it once we're looking at a whole list of them together? Um, the first thing we know is that they can be nested. If you look at an example up there um, of, the, uh, of the little um, chat where someone has given their, their status update, um, those can have comments nested inside of them. So this can actually be a, a nested uh, nested block. It can have itself inside of it. And also it needs to clear fix. And we noticed as well that sometimes it has an optional right button where you can remove it, the little X. Almost more importantly, you want to ask yourself, what don't you know about this object? Um, what isn't clear? What, what are we going to leave uh, flexible about this object? First up, the image width and decoration obviously vary. This is something it can have a bunch of different kinds of images. It could even have a video. So um, that is an unknown. The width needs to be stretchy. Um, the right content's completely unknown. In some cases, it's just a single line of text or a link. In other cases, it can be quite complex. Um, so right content is unknown as well. The width of this actual object is unknown. I could put it in the right column, and it needs to adapt there. I could put it in the center column, and it needs to work nicely there. Basically, it needs to adapt to whatever size grid or container it's been placed within. We also want to separate structure from Chrome. So one of those little items had a blue background, and the other one had a white background. Now, if we tie the structure of this object into the Chrome, which is that it happens to have a blue background in one case and a white background in another, we'll end up duplicating and copy-pasting that code, uh, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so we want to uh, separate that out into a separate class. Um, it's a tiny bit of HTML. It's a really simple object, basically a wrapper div an image with a link um, and a uh, body in which you can put you know, any kind of content that you like. It takes about four lines of CSS to make this happen. Basically, we need a clear fix. Um, we need to create a new formatting context on the body. Um, we need to float the image left and set our margins and paddings where they need to be. 
Um, so it's not a very complex object. It's, it's, a, it's very basic, but if I had to say what is the web made of in terms of CSS, this object is probably more uh, used across the web than, than maybe any other single, single device. So what did it mean for Facebook? This is my Facebook stream on the left, and then I've highlighted in the right all the places where they've been able to use this one single block, these four lines of code, and how much of the site has been able to be built out of this simple abstraction. Um, it's, it's really quite, um, quite cool when Nan, who's their UIE manager, um, sent around uh, an email to the team saying, hey, wait, guys, I think if we, if we do this, we can, we can cover almost all of our site. I found what, what Facebook is made of. Uh, it, it was a great moment because uh, we really realized we could get a great um, uh, amount, of, amount of look and feel out of a single uh, tiny object. A lot of people say, oh, well, if you make these abstractions, isn't the HTML going to get bigger? Um, won't that sort of pose a problem? Um, you know, maybe if we were writing absolutely perfectly optimized HTML in every case, it would make it slightly larger because you'd have a few extra class names. Um, but in the real world, um, in this example of the stream story, when Stefan Parker um, implemented uh, these Legos for the stream story, he was able to reduce the HTML size by about 50%. Um, so in the real world, there's a, there's a pretty substantial HTML benefit. This is from the, the Facebook uh, developer blog. Um, Jason Sobel, who's their, the perf manager uh, extraordinaire there, he um, said that due to these efforts, we cut our average CSS bytes per page by 19%, um, and our HTML bytes per page by 44%. Um, so pretty big, uh, pretty big improvement. Okay, so this is how you can get in contact with me and Stoyan. And um, the open source project is listed on the bottom. There's a URL for it. Uh, the media block and a bunch of other um, examples are, are there. And, um, and you can feel free to download them, try to break them, try to use them in ways that they don't work and send me bugs because then I can make them even more robust. I like that a lot. Okay, thanks so much. All right, uh, thanks, Nicole. I think we've got time for one question. Does anybody have a question they'd like to ask? Um, go over here. Where do we send our CSS people to read about it? I blog at uh, stubbornella.org, and um, I write about it there. Um, I'm also kind of writing a book, but I'm sort of terrible at it, so it's taking a while. Um, but yeah, I think stubbornella.org, and there's a Google group as well, and there are a lot of people who are getting into it and using it on different sites and sort of uh, testing out the different objects. And oh yeah, and there's oocss.org. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thanks, Nicole.